I will take this five minutes that I have to, to actually continue with the rebranding of Sweden CPP because we we'll know that Sweden CPP, I didn't create the name, it was originally Sweden minus CPP because this meetup never had a, a meetup group, it never had a meetup. And when the organizer stepped back and I took it over that it doesn't, doesn't disappear, I removed the hyphen, so it became Sweden CPP. And at this moment, we were the only active user group, C++ user group in Sweden. Then half a year later, I found out that there is a user group in Göteborg. And I contacted the head some meetups two years ago or three years ago. And I contacted the organizer there and I asked him if I can help him to find the venue and meetup host and, and sponsors. And I did never get an answer, but the, the, the organizer from the Göteborg group stepped back. So there was another uh, leading less meetup group with C++. So I waited that someone take over, but no one did. So I took it over and then I contacted people in Göteborg. If you want to, you can drive this group and finally found some. So there's also then we had a group in Göteborg. And from this moment, I started to think to rename Sweden CPP because it's a little bit too inclusive. And but at this moment, we talked internally a little bit. It was so that people started to know us. We had the first meetups, people come. And it was so when we change the name, it will be strange. So I postponed this. And begin of this year, Olafur, he will talk later with you. He created the group in uh, Malmö. And this was then the, the, the kickoff that I said, okay, now we need to do something. So the first of the, of the rebranding is I renamed us to Sweden CPP Stockholm. And this is just the first date. I think we will end up as Stockholm CPP. And Sweden CPP in the summer holidays, I created this website. And this is just a meetup event accumulator from all uh, meetups we have here in Sweden from the three groups, uh, Stockholm, Göteborg, and Malmö. I have here a very nice sponsor section where I have taken the text from Adi, actually, because he has written the text original for his user group and I just transferred no, actually, it. I think John Carl wrote most of it. So, <laughs> and it's a creative comment, so you're most welcome. Yes, yes, <laughs> I know, but I'm thankful that someone did the work. So. And this brings me to the next when I'm talking about uh, the user group. So it is about C++, of course, we are here about because of C++, but it's also about people and collaborating. And that's a wonderful thing, right? We have the visitors because without visitors, it would be pretty boring. We have the people that speak for our events and we have an impressive list. So when we look at YouTube, it is a lot of talks that happened. When I think about YouTube, the people that helped me getting starting this, Shil Olaf, Björn, Jonas, without them, we wouldn't be where we are here now. All the people that helped to make these events happen, every place we visited, there is someone who cared about people that we can have this event at this place. And we have been at very many places and we will see new places in future also. And this is the beautiful thing about Sweden CPP or Sweden CPP Stockholm to Stockholm CPP and the nickname CPP Nolotta. And that you have a, a roughly, you can roughly grasp how much this is to do. And this meetup today started actually as an idea from Björn and Adi uh, early summer, I would say. And since then we have had, well, for sure 100 mails going from and back. <laughs> technical evaluations, technical testing until this evening stands. I had nothing to do with all this. I was just disturbing the people that do work. Most have done by, by Sean. So it's all about people, but Sean is sitting there. He wants to be in the background, but this is the wonderful thing about Sweden CPP. So it is C++, it is people, it is coming together, sharing knowledge, growing knowledge, Connecting with other user groups, and this, I think this will have a great future, the connection of user groups in the world. And that's in short, Sweden CPP, Stockholm, Stockholm CTP, CCP, Nolotta. And just uh, the next dates, because I usually say them, 22nd November, 11th December, and 17th January, mark these dates. And if someone from Israel or 
I may want to come to visit us, you're welcome. Also, if you want to come and give a talk here in Stockholm, please just ping me. And that's it here from me, from Stockholm ZPP. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Harold, for that uh, uh, lovely presentation about the Sweden CPP. And now uh, we will move on to Olafur uh, in Malmö, who will present their user group. Please uh, welcome them. There we go. Can you hear me okay? I know you guys can yeah. hear me. That's great. So my name is Olafur. Um, I'm probably on the wrong camera now. I need to switch this over in a bit. Um, so this summer, so I like to learn. I like learning. I like learning new stuff. And I like C++. So I thought, there must be a C++ user group here in Malmö. And there wasn't. So I contacted uh, Fu Cafe here in Malmö that does a lot of user groups and said, so is there a C++ user group here? And they were like, yeah, there is one, I think. Uh, they met sometime last year. They're not doing much. So I wanted one. So I made one. And now I'm here. <laughs> and now you're here. And that's the thing with a uh, user group. You just you make them, you ask people to come, and you grow a little community. And we have grown a bit now since the, the summer. We're doing, I think we're up to six meetings now. And um, of course, if someone from Stockholm or Israel would like to come and talk as well, <laughs> then of course, welcome. Uh, we're not that far from Copenhagen, so that's a, a plus for us. Um, yeah, so the main idea was to at least have some meetings here, grow the community. And uh, uh, so after I had yelled on Twitter and said I would like a user group, I was pointed to Harald, which then dumped all of his information on me and said, this is how you make a user group, and this is how it's set up, and these are all the best practices. And so he was able to dump all of his knowledge onto me, and uh, it's very appreciated. So that's really, really nice. Um, yeah, I don't have much else to say about the user group. We're a small little group that uh, are growing and growing. So that's it from my end. Thank you very much, Offer. Uh, so nice that you could uh, kick it off there in Mama. Uh, okay, and uh, last but not least, let's hear it from uh, Israel by uh, Adi. All right, so I'm going to give a short presentation about our user group. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm so happy and so excited that this happened. Uh, having a distributed meetup was one of my stretch goals when I originally started the group. Just a little bit about us. Okay. So... Like most C++ user groups, uh, I, I was looking for a C++ user group and I couldn't find one. There were some C-sharp ones, a lot of web development languages, Python, that kind of scripting languages. And I wanted something that focuses only on C++, uh, as primarily on C++. The second thing that happened is that there were um, meetups. Uh, some, some of them happened in Jerusalem, which is a big development center, and also in, in the Tel Aviv area, which is an even bigger uh, has an even bigger high-tech industry, and I wanted to pull people from both ends because nobody uh, ever tried uh, going from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Now, just to give you some scale, I put a map of Europe here in the corner, and you can see Sweden, and Israel is that little uh, uh, blotch in the corner, and uh, the whole distance, this is the Tel Aviv and, and Jerusalem are in the top left and bottom right corners. The distance here is 54 kilometers. Okay, so just to give you a sense of scale for Israel, is that's too long to drive once a month. So we actually have, uh, we co-locate our meetups alternating between Mevaser Zion and uh, Modin, uh, which is, Modin is more or less in the middle. And that's how I try to get people from both ends. Of course, what we end up having is like only the most dedicated C++ folks who actually would agree to drive uh, 20 or 25 or 30 minutes to our meetups. Of course, we try to cover a, broad, uh, a very broad range of topics. We have monthly meetings. Uh, we've been, um, and trying to cater really to everybody from beginners to experts. Uh, we do a lot of, I try to do a lot of community building activities. I'm not sure this is gonna work uh, today, so I'm just gonna skip, but this is Meet Your Neighbor. I really recommend for all users groups to try this. Basically give the audience three minutes to talk to whoever uh, is sitting next to them which they didn't happen to come with. Uh, and it's a great way to meet your fellow developers and, and build the community. 
Now, just a little bit more about the group. Today is, in fact, the year, uh, the one year anniversary since I opened the Meetup account for uh, our group. So I just noticed this today. Uh, we kick, uh, the first Meetup was in November uh, last year. We've had uh, 12 monthly, 12 meetups until now, 11 monthly ones, and another out of band uh, meetup after a large conference in Tel Aviv. We video uh, most of the talks. We've already got uh, these. These numbers are always out of date by the time we actually present them. Although I did this this afternoon, so we have some. We have our own YouTube channel. We have, uh, we have on Twitter and Meetup, and our code of conduct is the Berlin Code of Conduct. Um, Right. Where can you find us? We're on Meetup, on YouTube. You can find our website on, on the, uh, at this address. This presentation will be online, so it's easy to, you don't need to jot this down quickly. Uh, as I said, we're, we post pretty much about once a day on Twitter. You can find us on Slack. We have our own channel. And we have a Facebook page, which gets updated together with the Twitter account. So a little bit of news for us for today. So uh, CPPCon videos are starting to go up. And uh, Michael's talk is already online. I really recommend it about CUDA. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Michael is my co-organizer and he's the producer. He did most of the legwork here. Like Harold, I didn't do much. I was just CC to most of the emails. Uh, Michael did most of the hard work. Uh, so thank you, Michael. He's doing an amazing job. Uh, our next meetup is November 27th in Tel Aviv. Uh, it's, it's a new location, uh, which is going to be uh, quite an amazing. Uh, we're going to have two talks about uh, CUDA optimizations, low latency C++. The talks will be online on YouTube, so even uh, for the, our remote, remote viewers, you, you'll be able to watch them. And in the past month, we've actually been working furiously on some, something much bigger than this. And I think most of you already know, I've mentioned this before, we're going to actually have a, a C++ conference. And we have the dates. It's going to be in Tel Aviv, in the uh, Tel Aviv Yafo Academic College, in May, the 14th to 17th of May. Um, it's a two-day conference, two tracks per day, uh, with a pre-conference training day and a post-conference half a day of a hackathon or post-conference training. Call for speakers will go out very, very soon. Um, anybody who's interested, please get in touch with me. I'm, I'm easy to find. and. Uh, uh, I will give you more details. I'm so super excited about this. This is going to be really amazing. It's, this was the last item on my stretch goal list, and this is uh, hopefully going to happen. So, no, now I have to find most more stretch goals. <laughs> right, and of course I want to thank our sponsors today, ShellTech. Uh, they provide the, the provide the venue pretty consistently over the past year. They give us an amazing uh, facilities, and they also support a lot of startups and companies to, to help them bootstrap and support them with uh, business consulting. Final, um, they do a, a high frequency trading in our business department. They all have an office in Arcelia, and they're always happy to uh, to meet new developers because they have a lot of challenges. So thank you, and I'm super excited about this meetup. Um, and let's, I think now we can move on to the lightning talks, right? Yeah. Today I'm going to give a brief lightning talk. Brief, I hope it won't be weak to you. It's from IOTA to Stateful uh, Lambda. So, we write code. We would like to write some tests that test our code. And uh, many times you just need to fill up some collection with artificial data to run your test. Now, uh, this method is frequently uh, being used, just hard coding. Uh, collection of uh, items, and uh, the, there's the big problem with this is one, it's not taking uh, the intention. You don't know why did I stop with J? What is the reason? Uh, and the second one, if the initialization is of <coughs> more complex objects, then we are increasing the chance of making some mistake while coding uh, the data. We would like to have something. Uh, we would like to fill up our uh, vector over here in some more sw smarter way. Uh, 
preferably using some algorithm in the standard library. So the first algorithm is IOTA, a new invention of C++ 11. And what it does, it takes begin and end iterators, initial value, and applying the increment of operator one by one until it reaches the end. So we want to fill up our vector with, with our letters, then it, we have a, a fairly consistent way and it's much more clear and less uh, error prone. The problem uh, with this method that it is only working for simplistic cases uh, where you need to fill up a simple range with ever increasing uh, value or decreasing. But if you want to do something more complex, a more complex initialization of our uh, vector, we would need to do, uh, we would need to use something else. And this is where our stateful lambda comes in. Now, what is a stateful lambda? Just let's look at the lambda over here. Uh, stateful lambda is uh, C++ 14, new in C++ 14, and it uh, enables us, it's a feature that enables us to put uh, or define new variable and initialize them in the initialization list over here. And then not only we can initialize them, we can further mutate them, and they are being called each, on each call of the lambda, we get the same uh, uh, variable updated. <coughs> that also make us, uh, uh, makes the lambda uh, mutable. So now we have, again, our example where we uh, filled up our uh, vector with the uh, letters, but now, and, and then we can use uh, the algorithm uh, of the generate. There are a few, few algorithms in the family of generate here. We're using, I'm using the generate n to uh, create uh, the members of our vector here. You just need to put the back inserter and the vectors keep filling up as much as needed. Each uh, element uh, being called from the lambda or generated from the lambda. So if we want to put, but what if we want to do some more complex initialization? Um, for example, let's take a look at this uh, uh, struct of employees. You want to fill up and you want to fill the different, uh, uh, the different fields of the struct using uh, various uh, methods. So we can just define some initializers of various types. We can uh, calculate them or make calculate one based upon the other. So we have here um, two variables. I'm using uh, the I and the join. The join is a date type, the I is an integer. And at the end, I just create the returned object, synthetic ID, synthetic name, joining date, department, and it's all uh, there. Okay, uh, these are the references, mostly come from CPP weekly and the slides and code samples I just shown will be available on our site. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So, uh, I guess there are no questions because uh, the speaker went back home, sitting there. So I'm uh, to the next topic, uh, C++17 and the template auto edition. Um, my name is Emil Kirsch, and they thought, um, well, we don't have auto enough in the language. We need to put auto in another new place. And the, the idea was left 
take it into template. Um, so um, it starts with um, type and non-type template parameters. Um, you know that uh, in a template you can have type parameters and non-type parameters, like in this example, my array is using type name T for the type and size, which is size T for its size. Both are known at compile time. Um, you probably remember the rules for what can be uh, the non-type parameter. Um, this is nice. This is just a reminder. Um, when we come to variadic templates with type parameters, we can see that um, each type can be different, which means you have, um, for example, a sum, and we want, you want to sum different types. This is doable. Um, so T can be any type, and you can see that you can mix the types quite easily. No news here. When you go to non-type parameters, and here I have something a bit different. In the previous slide, I was using uh, functions overloading, which usually is not the best way to uh, use for templates, but it was working for the previous slide. Here I'm using specialization. So I have here um, some different sum um, implementation. In this implementation, I want to sum numbers or things that are known in compile time. So I'm using it through the template itself. Uh, so I have here a struct which um, uh, catches the actual numbers in compile time. And then uh, in the uh, way that uh, we use usually for variadic templates, we have the uh, single case uh, in case I have only one number and the multiple case. And at the end, I can call sum with the template parameters and have the sum of one for two in this example. And now the question is, can I mix types? Can I send here into sum, into the template parameters of sum, different types? Like for example, one and a and two. And in this example, I'm using char and not floating points because floating point and double are not uh, legitimate as a template non-type parameter, but char is. So can I do that? And the answer is, well, no, you cannot. And why you cannot in uh, C++ 14? You cannot because for the single case, it's easy. You just use the template type parameter to say what is the next non-type that you have. So you use template type num t and then t num. That's nice. Now, if you want to give the type for all the non-type parameters, you need to use variadic for both the type and the non-type, like in the middle of the slide. The problem is that you need to use both variadic templates for the type and the non-type, and you get the compilation error that the template pack, the pack must be the last template parameter. And in this example, <coughs> somebody would be last, but only one of them. Uh, now, there is a solution before C++17, and the solution is to wrap up the type and the value. It's ugly. We are looking for something else. And we remember that we want to stick out to somewhere. So let's think uh, what can we do. And C17 brought uh, the following solution. Uh, so instead of just saying, OK, we have integers or we have chars, let's say that we have none type parameters of type auto. So in this case, we have a template of auto num and num can be any non-type parameter. And then we have the template for the variadic case with auto num and then uh, a pack of auto nums. And it works perfectly with one and char a and two. Of course, all need to be known as compile time. Uh, so ep for a, that's nice. But I think that I still have some time. Um, but how did tuple work before that? Didn't we have? Wouldn't we have a problem with tuple before the template auto? Um, well, the answer is no, we don't, because tuple is not non-type parameter based. It's the type, and the type can be different. So if you can, uh, if you take a look at tuple, tuple takes the actual values in runtime as function parameters or as constructor parameters. 
Uh, there is something nice in C++17. You don't have to use make type, but you can just call the constructor, send the actual parameters that you want, and rely on class template argument deduction. We'll not talk about that right now. Um, tuple is also interesting because how it holds its values, it's like a mystery. Because usually what we do when we get um, pack, um, template pack parameters, we just pass them, which is the easiest thing to do. You get that and you say, well, I know there is a constructor who wants to take that from, let's say, in place. So we just pass that on. But tuple does not have this privilege. Tuple needs to hold it, so we'll not talk about that right now, but this is interesting. Um, so Tuple is not the case. It doesn't need the template auto, but there are other cases. Uh, there is another case. Um, another usage for template auto is the following. Suppose that we have a class, and the class has a non-type parameter, for example, foo, in this example, has a size. And suppose that foo doesn't hold the size in a static variable or in another way, and we want to extract the size that foo got. So we want something like a generic function extract size that will take a type t, because <laughs> it doesn't have to be foo, it can be anything. And then we want to extract the actual size of t, okay? So something that like return k, which is the size from t k, and for foo of six, we would like to get back six. Now, this can be done without template auto back in C14 or C11 easily, but we need to say that the type T is templated on size T. <coughs> we need to know the actual type of the non type parameter. We need to know that it is a size T. So we have here a template template parameter because we say, okay, T is a template variable. And then the template is getting two variables, t, which is the template variable, and k, which in a way describes t. And then we get t of k, but we need to say that t is conditioned, is templated over size t. And there isn't a way before C17 to say that t is templated over some unknown non-type. Now we can try that. Let's try that before C17. Um, let's do that this way. Let's say that we have a type name, inner type, and then we have a template of inner type, which is unknown, and then we have the inner type as an additional template parameter. Now we do things like that with types, but it doesn't work with uh, uh, this way with a non type, and we get a compilation of saying, kind of template ignored, couldn't infer template arguments inner type. Why it couldn't uh, infer that? Because the standard says so. The, the standard says that the compiler doesn't need to infer that. By the way, the same code compiles well with C17. So in C17, this compiles, but you have a better syntax. And the better syntax is to go again to the template auto, which looks like that um, template. And inside, we have a template template parameter because we're saying, okay, T is a variable that we want to get as a template variable and extract from it the actual template parameter that it holds. And we have a template auto class T, then we get the auto K and we keep it as auto. And this way we can just extract K without knowing the type of K. That's nice. Uh, some links. So uh, the first one is the proposal uh, for the standard, and, and you can read there some uh, another nice example for uh, introducing <coughs> why, uh, what is the need, and two links to Stack Overflow or showing the usage, um, mainly things that I presented here. Um, so, if you can just uh, run this uh, <coughs> code, and if you have any questions, no time for questions. No time for questions. No, Thank you, Israel. We're now gonna switch over to uh, Malmo with uh, their lightning talk. So, when everyone's ready, please welcome them. Yeah, okay, good. Um, my name is uh, Sven Rademakers. Uh, I work at uh, Massive Entertainment. So yeah, to today's talk, I realize we don't have uh, that much time, so I want to keep it light and I want to maybe keep it playful as well. Um, so, uh, I like uh, to trigger people a little bit, so um, 
I uh, thought uh, I, I I put a bold statement on my on my slide. Uh, Heap is evil. Um, who here uh, does not agree with the, with the statement that uh, heap allocation is inferior over uh, stack allocation? Nobody. I already thought that. And um, uh, who doesn't? Who does agree with me that uh, heap is evil? Can you? Can somebody give reasons uh, why 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 you think that? I have a lot of locality issues going back. And forth. Mm -hmm. So, uh, other reasons, locality issues. Takes longer performance, right? So, uh, uh, a heap uh, a stack allocation, we only have to up stack pointer. Heap allocation, we need to do more tricky things, other things. Maybe um, it's more wasteful, right? We need to do some bookkeeping on uh, the blocks that uh, that we allocated. It fragments so as well. Thing. All uh, all valid reasons. So. Um, if everybody agrees with me, I think uh, we're done for today. <laughs> no, but um, so um, we can say uh, that uh, this is uh, maybe more uh, uh, a bulky statement uh, from uh, from an uh, embedded engineer. I actually had a colleague who, who said something like this, but um, I later learned that he was uh, a quite sarcastic person as well. But uh, <laughs> um, so where do we see this the most? It's um, an embedded environment where we have limited resources, uh, maybe where there is a real-time requirement, right? Because uh, a heap allocation is also non-deterministic, uh, can also have some uh, uh, re-entrancy uh, problems, right? Um, uh, and maybe when there is long uptimes required, these are generally the rules of thumb. Uh, anybody something to add on this? Fairly okay, right? Um, so. What I wanted to share today as well is um, uh, that um, this uh, heap, uh, heapless programming is a thing. It's, uh, it's mainly in the embedded world so be, due to the fact that uh, on desktops, we, uh, this, the, these kinds of problems is less significant. Uh, and we have, of course, a lot of hardware um, mitigations uh, where we uh, don't suffer that much from these uh, problems. Um, we can also uh, program in uh, C++, of course, without heap. Um, and I wanted to uh, touch on one little uh, thing, um, which I f found uh, useful. So yeah, I, I, I put here the pants, right? So heap is evil, it depends. One of the things of C++ is polymorphism, and that's uh, a quite fundamental thing in C++, which uses dynamic memory, right? Um, so if we take the, the school uh, example, we have an instrument I, uh, we have a derived class from guitar, I uh, allocate uh, an object on the stack, and I execute my, uh, my function play instrument. Now I um, want to make this heap less. Um, and I'm first going to show the uh, result. I uh, came up with uh, a solution, uh, something like this. Um, it's, a, it's a container where I put in all my types, so I know uh, exactly the, the biggest possible uh, memory allocation I need to do. Um, and then I uh, construct it on the stack. I uh, put a guitar object in there, and I say, play instrument. So there's a little bit a lot of code, um, but I will point you to the most important parts. Um, basically, it works. We have a storage. Um, we 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 calculate uh, uh, the size of it. Uh, we have something in SD apparently that's called aligned uh, aligned union. Um, it gives back the the type, the aligned type uh, corresponding or which these types fit into. And then we have over here at the end place function, we have the, the placement new, and that's basically like your, your biggest friend when, when going heapless. Uh, you, can, you can construct objects on a given address, right? So uh, we have here a new. We say we want to uh, construct on the address of storage, and uh, we uh, construct object of type T, and we put uh, the arguments uh, in there. Um, 
and that's basically it. Um, the takeaway uh, for today, I think, is uh, uh, for me as well as a uh, more like a desktop programmer, there are also uh, other ways to, to program, and it, um, it's, 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 it's nice to do because you have, need to have a different perspective on the, on the same problem. Um, it's not always, um, uh, it's not always a, a convenient thing to do, right? I mean, there are certain scenarios where or uh, environments where we want to go even heapless. Um, but it's a, it's a fun thing to play around with. So thank you, guys. All right. Thank you, Malmo, for that uh, lovely and insightful presentation. Uh, now we will do uh, the Sweden CPP Lightning Talk. So uh, please welcome the Sweden CPP Lightning Talker on the stage. Okay, there we go. How I stopped worrying and started trust YouTube for CPP wisdom. Mikael Rosbacke, freelance D++ developer since many years. It's a true meta talk, a talk about talks. So let's start. I spend way too much time on YouTube. So um, what is good for? How do you learn C++ today? You start with books, you do some programming, you get tired of the books, you try to find new books, um, somewhere you want to see some people. You go to meetup groups, but that finally you find YouTube. I'm not sponsored. <laughs> so what do you find on YouTube? You can find conferences. Uh, these are the ones I mainly draw my wisdom from. Uh, CppCon, most people know about. But meeting CPP, ACU, and CPP now was a good. And a few talks from Pacific C. And then you have all these user groups like this one that's also out there. So it's a good place to go. There's a lot of people. Uh, I can say from start here uh, the, this is online. If you want to see something, find the talk, put it into Google, and you find it. So, see us as a smurgos board of different stuff to select from. The big names, also, these are the ones that I found interesting. Um, maybe they're not for everybody, but that's the... I got something out of these guys. All the big names, uh, some less known. It's, they all made some good contributions. So let's start. <laughs> Multi-threading. You're interested in multi-threading. Uh, Kevin Henney is a British guy, always interesting to look at. He's a very good presenter, so it's fun talks to um, look to have. Uh, think outside the synchronization quadrant. It's a good one just to be able to don't share anything, then you don't have any problems. Uh, Ansel Schirmersheim, not sure how his name is presented, but he, I like his style. He's a very methodical guy who wants to get stuff right. So I think it's a, he's a good, good one to look into. Herb Sutter, the Microsoft uh, chief evangelist, I would call it. Uh, also a good presenter, uh, has good stuff for a more broader perspective. So he has two good talks on uh, multi-threading. Uh, some a bit older, but uh, still well, very relevant. And Sean Parent, one of my favorites. Uh, somehow he has managed to sail up and understand the language on a level I don't do. And when he talks, it just seems to make sense in a way that he didn't do before. So it's a good guy to look into. Coding techniques. How do you actually write C++ and uh, how can you vary different coding techniques? Better code, runtime polymorphisms. Sean Parrott shows a way how to avoid having uh, class hierarchies where you actually put the inheritance into the user of a class instead of having to do the class hierarchy on the object you're calling on. He's using some template tricks to do that stuff. So it's, it's more or less type erasure. He's uh, getting into there. Be honest, Rostrup, uh, in the same line, how to avoid class hierarchies, um, 
just use the object-based part, constructors, destructors, all that stuff. It seems to be sort of a trend, my takeaway. C++ module. Uh, John Lekos, a bit of a grumpy guy, but he's interesting, has a lot of uh, stuff to say. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good, he's a, he knows his stuff. And then we have Herb Sutter again, writing good C++ by default, talks about how to pass arguments, um, what the move semantics actually gives us today. Modernizing legacy C++ code. Uh, it's Kate Gregory is uh, actually interesting also. She's, she's written code since, uh, well, I was born then, but uh, 78, I think her, her year was, and knows a lot about the craft of making code, more or less. So there's a lot of insight in there. And Ansel again. Libraries, that's also good to have. Modern formatting library for C++, I think that's actually uh, sent for standardization, libfmt. Uh, it's a way to mix streams and old style uh, printf things in a type safe way that is quite pleasant to work with. Welcome to the time zone, Howard Hinnant, um, a guy who really likes details. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, it's impressive talk about what you can do with the time zones. Ranges, uh, also interesting. I haven't really got into it yet, but I understand that once you get into it, you can do a lot of stuff with it. And it's, it's a new topic that's coming. C++ live at head, Titus Winters from Google. Uh, they released uh, app sale, and he's talking about versioning and semantic versioning versus living at head. I think he had some interesting points in there, so it was interesting. Quite a little gem, system error. If you like uh, error handling, that's something to look into. Maybe not the most uh, splash, uh, flashy area to look into, but it's, I think it was a good talk. Include OS. That's just a cool ID. <laughs> um, I recommend that one. He also uses a lot of um, delegates. And that technique they're using in there with delegates is interesting in its own way. So that's a good one. Frontiers. This is sort of a bit forward looking. Uh, maybe not going to be in the standard, but it's interesting ideas at least. So Nat Goodspeed talk about fibers, old ID. But uh, there's a group of people trying to get uh, stack full fibers into the language. And I, I agree with them with the reason why it's a good idea. So it's a good one. There and back again, incremental C++ modules. Richard Smith, the, I think it's the editor of the standard. It's a bit of an older talk, but it uh, highlights some of the problems of actually getting modules into the language. And they are coming at some point. The question is just when. So we'll see. Hopefully 20. Best type rates that C++ doesn't have. That's a bit of um, out there. It's probably not going to make it in. But it's an interesting idea. It talks about tombstone traits, where you can have a class signal, so the number of states it doesn't use. So the users of that class can actually use those states to signal it doesn't occupy a valid state and also other traits to indicate a class is uh, trivially copyable. You can actually use memcop and stuff to, on collections of them. Titus, Win Titus Winters again. Um, yeah, that's a good overview of what's happening. I think he's actually done that talk on CPPCon 18 also, but I haven't seen that one yet. Embedded, that's my domain. I'm doing microcontrollers and embedded Linux and that stuff. So Mike Rich, Michael Case, Case is also a good guy to look at when you're doing embedded. Um, very laid back presentation style. So it's a, it's a good watch. Mike Rich is doing a talk on micro increments. So that's uh, test driven development. 
Maybe it's very down to earth, but the interesting part there is see the entire tool chain they're using, including t uh, tests and everything to actually test their embedded stuff. So, uh, Dan Sachs, old timer in the C world. He is, uh, that talk is a bit, uh, yet a bit down by it, but it, it, it highlights some of the cultural differences between C and C. It's, it's good to see if you are interested in C versus C++. And then Jason Turner, also the, what's it called? The C++, C++ cast or, yeah, CPP cast. Yeah, thanks. Rich Code on Tiny Computers. He's running a game on Commodore 64 in C++ 17. Quite impressive. So, in summary. You can spend some quality time uh, looking at YouTube, learning stuff, and build your own list of interesting topics that um, can be learned. So that's all for me. Go check it out. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, extremely brief uh, introduction on Bjorn for those of you who don't know that already. And, uh, Adi and I have been writing this uh, presentation together. So, Adi, can you shortly introduce yourself? Yes, I'm going to look here so you can see me properly. Uh, so, I'm Adi. I've been developing C++ since before the first standard. I do a lot of computer vision, algorithms, uh, machine learning, uh, some real time. And um, I read about this subject. Uh, about a year ago, and um, I happened to be talking to Bjorn online before we actually ever met face to face. I said, "Oh, this this would be a really cool thing to do." So, yeah, and you can take it from there. Okay, so yeah, the curiously recurring coupled types pattern. Um, I think. I think it's probably best that we we introduce this with a bunch of examples, and you can see that there is a, a, a pattern in these examples. I, I, I'll go through a, a few. And uh, by the way, please interrupt at any point if, if uh, there is something you're wondering about or something you would like repeated or whatever. Uh, disagreement that is always fun. So, so let's. Uh, Let's see some examples. Do we have a 2D space because it's so difficult to write to draw in 3D, especially when you're graphically handicapped as I am. Uh, so we have a vector, 2D vector, we call it V1. And we have another vector, V2, in, in this uh, two-dimensional space. And uh, an important thing about vectors here is that they have a direction and a length. Uh, they don't really have a position, but I have to draw them somewhere. So we, we, we can slide them around. It doesn't matter. It, nothing has changed. And we can add vectors. So V3 here is the, the sum of V1 and V2 by just sort of sliding the vectors so that you concatenate them. Then you get the, uh, the resulting vector. Uh, subtracting a vector is just reversing its direction. <laughs> So V1, V1 minus V2 is just sliding the, the reversed vector and getting the sum. So I presume no one is very surprised over this. We can also uh, scale a vector by multiplying with a scalar, uh, in this case, uh, double its size. Or we could divide it to get it shorter. Multiplying vectors. Not in this world. In, uh, in some situations, that makes sense, but not in this world. We're not doing that. This is clear so far, I presume. Nothing surprising. And we have points in space. Point exists. It's a, a location somewhere, a position. We can have some other position. And we say that. The difference we get by subtraction, subtracting two points is the vector from one point to another. So in this case, 
P2 minus P1 is the vector that gets you from P1 to P2. And we can add other vectors to get another point because a point plus a vector is a, is a point. A position plus a vector is a position. Can we add a point? No. I actually cannot imagine what that would mean. So no, we cannot do that. So enough of that. Uh, what did you say the, the time was in Israel, Adi? It's now just a bit after eight. A bit of, okay, we haven't started yet. That is interesting. Uh, <laughs> wow, um, okay. The Chrono Library, if you're familiar with that from, from the C++ standard library. So <laughs> this uh, extremely ugly construction is uh, a clock face. So we have two points in time now represented by clock phases. So if we subtract them, what, what is the question mark? What is that? A duration, yes, exactly. It's the amount of time that has passed between the these two time points, like so. Can we add time points? No, doesn't make sense. And we can add a duration to a time point to get another time point. Does, the, does that sort of ring familiar with the vector example? where we have points in space, and, or in this case, points in time, and we have vectors in space or durations in time. Pointer arithmetic, everybody loves that, right? Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm guilty of having watched a, a Norwegian uh, pop science program called Ikke gjør dette hjemme, don't do this at home. Uh, in this case, it's reversed. Please do this at home, but not at work. <laughs> <laughs> so we have an array of uh, a number of things, <laughs> and we can get a, a pointer to one of the elements in the array, and another pointer to another element in the array. So what is the meaning of subtracting two pointers? What, what do we get? What is the type of D? What, what, what is the meaning of D? You have to shout. PTRD. Uh, PTRD of T, yeah. What's, uh, what's PTRD of T? What, what a kind of type is that? It's a signed, inter signed integral type, yeah. What, are, what is the value? What does it mean? Distance, yes. So it's the number of A's to travel along the array from, from P1 to get to P2. <coughs> Can we add pointers? No. No. <laughs> I don't know what that would mean if we could. That's probably the reason we can't. Uh, but I can also do the other thing. I can have a point and uh, add or subtract a, a PTR DFT to get another, another pointer, like so. So X is the same, as, same value as P1, points to the same element. So are you seeing a pattern here? Because here's the interesting thing. Uh, all we're going to say today are things that you already know. Bummer, eh? Um, yeah. Adi posted this uh, January last year. Great introduction to affine geometry. Uh, Alcalc 1, novel algebraic operations for affine geometry. Uh, and I just had to respond. I think you may just have solved a long standing naming problem for me. Because at that time, I don't know. Some of you may know this. I have an experimental strong type library that I've been working on. And uh, I also watched uh, uh, Peter Holmberg's talk here in Stockholm about uh, 
concepts and uh, he stressed how important it, it is for your for your concepts to not be super detailed but so, sort of to embrace big ideas and i felt that this is the same thing but in reverse instead of describing a constraint for a, a generic type i'm constructing a type that has some uh, semantic meaning and it felt like this behavior is something i want to model but how can i model it if i cannot name it and i solved that for me so thank you and i think you. it's your turn now yeah okay so the pattern that we've all been seeing and, I've, and i was in exactly the same position when i saw all these things and i wanted to know how you actually call this because most of the mathematics that we see and we learn in, even at the university are always all the operations are closed over a single type what's called the monoid but that, that's just the mathematical name and here we have something slightly different and not very typical for for the regular the kind of math that we even if you learn some more modern abstract algebra and even if you go to some of the more basic category theory everything is still a monoid but here we have two types which are related very intimately with some very strict and rigid rules and and i was reading on slack and somebody just as an offhand remark said i find this and I come from, I do a lot of computer vision and graphics, and I've always known about affine transformations. And it turns out there, there, there is some mathematical relationship between them, but it's actually very uh, indirect. So it's really unrelated to those, and it's unrelated to something from language theory, which is called affine types. That's why we're not actually calling it affine types, although this talk is actually about types. It's about the affine spaces. Now, in math, an affine space intuitively comprises of two different types. The first one is a point, it's a position, specified with some coordinate values. And these types of points, they have many, many different um, names in different domains. So we might call them locations if it's a GPS coordinate. They could be uh, vertices in a graphical context. They could be addresses in memory. They could be time points on, on some kind of clock. The second entity, which Bjorn just saw, showed, I'll call it a vector, but it's actually the dif it's defined as the difference between two points. And again, this vector, which is a very abstract mathematical thing, basically something that has only a direction and a length, has different names. It might be called a shift or an offset, a displacement, can be called the duration, really depending on the actual context, but the, mathical, the, abs the abstract mathematical concept remains exactly the same. And these two types, or these two entities, have very intimate relationships, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. There's one thing that, uh, there's a comment here, which is, oh, just go back one second. One more. Oh. There's a comment here that sometimes uh, we don't necessarily have an origin, because when we have this separation between positions and displacements, we don't really need to know where the origin is. And, any, if you if you read the literature about affine space, it's some, sometimes called it's a vector space that forgot its origin. Because even if the origin is known, then any point can be represented as a vector from the origin. However, a point is still not a vector in the coordinate-free space. So even though your representation, let's say of the 2D example, might be two a tuple of two numbers, these are separate entities. They're not the same <laughs> type. They have they behave differently in different contexts. They have different algebraic uh, rules. Now let's see these rules. Yeah, next slide. And see some of the definitions. So, as I said, the affine space it has two types of entities: it has points and vectors. And of course, I'm not counting scalar, scalars here, but they are they, are, they exist. And they exist obviously because the first rule is that the vectors they they uh, they're closed under the normal vector space operations. So if you go back to the for, uh, linear algebra one, these are the, the typical vectors that we all uh, everybody might might be familiar with. But we must remember this is not to, not necessarily two D vectors like we saw in the chroma example. These may be one dimensional vectors, right? So the, or in in uh, the difference between two pointers is a we call it an offset in memory, but it, it's, a, it's some kind of number that represents a, a shift in the memory address space. So it's a one-dimensional vector. Now, the thing that affine spaces add, add above normal vector spaces are 
the two rules that define the relationships between points and vectors. So if we have a unique, uh, if we have two points P and Q, then we say that the difference between them is called the vector is going, and, it, and that vector behaves like any vector in a vector space. But the points do not actually, the points are not part of the vector space. They have their own uh, being, their own entity, and they stay, they remain the same, essentially. They're kind of, it's like if we're in Modin right now and Bjorn is in Stockholm, we can't subtract or move these positions because we're here and he's there. We can measure the distance between us. We can uh, maybe throw a paper airplane from here to there and hope, hope it will get there. Uh, um, but there's no way to do an operation on a point. And of course, we can reverse that just like Bjorn showed. We can add a vector to a point to get a vector. So in fact, these two uh, assignment or, or equality operators have two different types. It's like if we think about it as operators or operative overload, overloading, these are two different types in the parameter list and two, diff and then two different types in the return value, right? So, um, yeah. And, and here we can, I wrote, we wrote down the operations that are supported by Affin Space APIs. So now, remember, I'm not actually trying to teach you math. I'm trying to show you that there is a, a very solid 200-year-old mathematical uh, basis for how to do API design. And whenever you encounter this pattern of affine spaces, these are the, the types of operations that your types must uh, support. And generally, these are the only ones. Like we saw, there are some operations that don't make sense, like adding points. So on the vector operations, these are on the left. These are the normal, typical vector space operations, the closure under uh, uh, addition and subtraction and uh, multiplication by a scalar. Of course, subtraction is just addition with the multiplication of the inverse, right? So these are, this is even, uh, in terms of axioms, are actually fewer than these five. And the additional three affine operations that we have are the fact that a vector is the result of the subtraction between two points. So we have a subtraction operator taking two point type objects and returning a vector. and Similarly, we can add a point and a vector to, re to get another point. Right, so let's go back to the Chrono example and see some actual code and see how Chrono, the Chrono implementation is one of the best examples for affine space API <coughs> uh, truly inspirational. And we'll see exactly how these operations, uh, what these operations look like uh, in Chrono. So, this is just a very simple uh, slide, slide where, so we can define a system clock now that returns a time point, we call it begin, then we do some very important work, uh, and the end with the, the, the end time. When we, on line three, we can subtract, subtract the beginning from the end to get a new duration, not a point. So in fact, dur is a duration, the type, it's a uh, chrono duration. And then we can do some basic math with the same arithmetic rules that we just saw. So uh, almost is the sum of the point, which is big, plus a duration minus another duration. So one millisecond, this is a user, this is a, a standard literal uh, from chrono, <coughs> is the duration. And, and of course, we can subtract duration. We can add that to the begin. Same, similar about next, we add uh, a, the duration the duration is a regular vector. Remember, it's, it's a one-dimensional vector, but it's still a vector. It can be scaled using scalars, and we can find that uh, next is twice as long. Now, just so we get a, a little extra, here's an example. The last, uh, the UTC now and UTC next, this is C plus, 20, C plus 20 from the corona extension to time zones. Since we're doing a distributed uh, meetup now, so let's see some C plus 20 with different time zones. So in this case, UTC now is the time the clock, the time uh, at the uh, UTC clock, which is in Greenwich Village. It's not the local time here. And UTC next, again, I can add the duration, twice the duration to UTC now. Everything works okay. However, remember that UTC now is a different, it, it's still a time point, and it talks about the same time point in our global universe, right? But it has what I called before, it's a, it has a different origin. The origin is Greenwich the Greenwich line, it's not Israel standard time and it's not Swedish standard or European, Central European time. So 
Now, on the last line, I'm trying to subtract two time points. And we said, we, I just told you that it's, it's fine to subtract two time points, right? And as you see, this isn't actually going to compile. Because these two time points are related to different clocks. And the algebra doesn't allow that. So there you can think types. of hmm? There are different types because these time points are templated on the clock, right? That's really important. And this is one of the important messages we're going to see it later. Semantics uh, implies syntax, and, synta and va only valid syntax implies valid semantics. <laughs> invalid syntax implies invalid semantics. It's not allowed by the compiler. So the compiler is enforcing mathematical semantics of our types. This is the important part of but this talk. Isn't there is a casting between? There, you, can, a casting? you can do a clock cast in, yes. in, in Chrono. Uh, the question was is if there is a casting between the two time points. Indeed, there is. It's called clock STD chrono clock cast, but you have to call it explicitly. Okay. Oh, and by the way, in chrono, one important thing is that uh, contrary, for example, to 2D vectors, uh, time points and durations may be implemented totally differently. So the internal representation is not just necessarily a single number. In order, it has a lot of things, STD ratios and that kind of thing. So uh, again, this is another abstraction. The presentation may be different. OK, next. Iterators. Everybody, you see it's the pointers with the sparkly pointers. <laughs> um, right, so let's see uh, this example with STD vector. It looks essentially very similar to what we would expect with pointers. Uh, we have a vector take it with four elements. We take the beginning, the end. We can subtract these two uh, iterators because iterators, remember, they be their time points. They're, they're like the time points. They're positions. We can subtract them to get an integer. And notice this is not an iterator. It's an integer or it's an iterator oh, difference, right? Uh, and we can do some uh, regular operations. And in fact, in some older STL versions, STD vector iterators were implemented by pointers. So it's not surprising that the same syntax would work exactly the same. I do want to make my, one more note about pointers, that even when s the language C was designed, and probably earlier than that, somebody made the conscious choice of making pointers a distinct type from just an index into the memory address space. So somebody already 40 or 50 years ago, because this is probably goes earlier than C, uh, already understood that affine spaces have an important aspect in the type system. Okay, I think this is really it's a big insight that I had when I was researching my blog post about this. Now, okay, but now you're saying, okay, but the STD vector is essentially like an array and everything uh, behaves like pointers. So how does that hold for containers, which are like associative containers, which do not have consecutive memory and the relationship to pointers is tenuous? Next slide. Right, so here I have the same example with STD set. And the code is essentially identical, or I will go for, as far as I say, it's semantically identical syntactically a little bit different because in this case, instead of uh, when we, uh, of course, we set the values into the set, we take the beginning iterator, the end iterator, and we want to count the difference between begin and end. Instead of using subtraction, we can use std distance. Instead of using uh, uh, this plus operator, we can use std next, which has a second argument, which tells you how, how many uh, elements, how many steps we want to jump ahead. There's also something called std advance, which is like the plus equals operator. <coughs> I didn't mention it before with the operator, I didn't want to overload the slide. But of course, if your data is mutable, you can always add the syntactic sugar of plus equals and uh, star equals and so on, minus equals. You could use the same syntax. At you the have first. to shout. You, you could use the same syntax at the vector, right? It could, it could you, be the same. No, you can't. Uh, you can use the same syntax as the vector only for random access iterators. If they're not random, let's say I use the std forward list here, you can't. Or, or it might be because these have different uh, complexity guarantees for different iterator types. Yeah, but the, the result would be the same, right? No, but they don't support operator overloading. They do support distance next? Yes. 
Distance, you know what? In a set, what's the distance between an and A? A set is a sorted, it's a sorted container. It's, it's not unordered. It's not unordered. In a hash table, it has no meaning. In set, is uh, it's sorted by the operator less than. Yeah. Okay. Next slide. Okay, so just to, to show you that this is not very as common as we would hope it would be, I'll show you some counter examples. Now, in this case, I've been using uh, the OpenCV, the Open Source Computer Vision Library for many years, so I'm going to pick on that. But this is in no way limited only to OpenCV. So uh, we have this type called CD point. It's a 2D point. We can define the position to be, in this case, the owl. Um, and um, yeah, is, can you see the owl? Can everybody see the owl now? That's all you can see now, right? <laughs> Um, and now we can do all these strange operations on points, which it's really unclear what they mean. I mean, how? what does it mean to, first of all, to construct a point from a vector? Okay, maybe we say, okay, it's the distant, the point at some kind of offset from the origin. Maybe we can live with that. But what does it mean to actually add two points? What, what's the semantic meaning in any geometric domain <laughs> to do the addition of two points? But OpenCV supports this without a problem. Again, the, the, we can take the difference between two points and get the direction, but the direction is not a displacement, it's a point. So how did we suddenly go from a 2D offset to some position in space? What's the relationship here? As we saw in, in Bjorn's example, you can move vectors around and it's still the same vector, right? And similarly, we can scale them and, and multiply them. What does it mean to scale a point? Totally unclear. Um, and again, just to say, OpenCV is not the only library that does this. PCL, the point cloud library, uh, suffers from the same thing. Uh, Eigen, which is a, an excellent uh, linear algebra header-only library, also ignores this aspect. Uh, there's a library called the Computational Geometry, uh, Geometry uh, Algorithm Library, and they actually are a final way. So I will give them credit. Now, you might ask yourself, oh, oh wait, wait. Um, you might ask yourself, why does it matter? Why do we care? I mean, this is really convenient to write because I know if I'm in a vector or a displacement or a point. And all I can say is the next slide. Remember the Mars Climate Orbiter, <laughs> right? Because uh, this is a multi-billion dollar Mars exploration surveying mission, and basically software that calculated the total impulse produced by thruster firings produced results in pound for seconds. The trajectory calculation software then used these results expected to be in Newton seconds to update the predicted position of the spacecraft. So this spacecraft arrived at Mars and basically crashed itself because of a unit mismatch. So, and my point here is that there is a very uh, very uh, big analogy between the type of affine types that are, we're talking about and unit systems. It's the kind of thing that we have to keep, the stronger our type system is, the more bugs and error will be caught at compile time instead of runtime or post-launch time, right? So, yeah, so remember the, not, not just the VASA, remember the Mars Climate Orbiter. Next. Okay, so uh, I think this is Bjorn's gonna show you something, some cool talk. Yeah, uh, so um, I've been studying a, a number of uh, GUI libraries. The, I'm, I'm really not a GUI programmer, but, but um, after at the end I agreed to try to do this talk, I, I'm sort of made it a point to study a number of GUI libraries. And just to give examples, I'm, I'm showing a, a completely imaginary GUI library, so nothing like this exists. So I have a, I have a library where I can create a, a window, and in this case, the constructor takes a point for the bottom left corner and a size. And you can see the uh, alias at the, the top there that the size is a 2D vector. So on the right, you can see how we can create a window with, if I have two points, I have the bottom, bottom left and the top right corner, I can create them using uh, the, the point P1 for a bottom left, and I can 
calculate the size from uh, P2 minus P1 because subtracting two points is a vector. Or I maybe uh, want to, to translate a, a window on the screen. And for, for, for that, I use uh, an offset to say I want to move it this far in this direction. So it, of course, takes a, a vector. And uh, if I don't have, again, a vector, I can calculate one using the point that is my desired new position for the window. Or maybe I have a, a function to, to move it to a specific point. And uh, as Adi was showing about uh, other graphics libraries or, or uh, 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 vector algebra libraries, uh, they have a tendency to not get this right. And I cannot claim to have studied all GUI libraries, but of those, those I have studied, not a single one got this right. Every one of them confused points and uh, offsets. Helter Skelter. Uh, and uh, that is a missed opportunity to be expressive in your API, say, what do I actually mean here? What do I want? And it's also a missed opportunity to catch errors. So I'm wearing the t-shirt. Let's see how this works. So did you know that uh, you can include URLs in, in Compiler Explorer? Yep. Cool. <laughs> now you do. If you didn't, now you knew. Now you, now you do. Uh, so I, after Adi and I, we met at uh, NDC Oslo and wrote the abstract for, for this talk. And uh, on my way home, I was bored at uh, Oslo Airport waiting for my flight. So I wrote a library for the generic affine space types. And that is what I'm using here. So I have a generic 2D vector type with integers that I just have a position X and Y, and I, I can add them. So th this is the, the typical <laughs> GUI library type that, that we don't know if this is a, an offset or a position. So we don't want that. So what I can do is use this uh, library and say, no, I have 2D vector uses the V uh, as its uh, representation, and I have a tag on it. The, the tag is just there to, to make it a unique type. So I can have, let, let's say the V is uh, an int instead. I can have several displacements of type, type int, but with different tags, and then they are completely different types, and I cannot confuse them, which is a very good thing. Uh, and then I say that I have, it, a position type that is an affine position, again using V with its tag. And I say that, yeah, and by the way, my, uh, my vector type is, is this one, Vec2D. <coughs> Another way of uh, easier achieving the same is to, to say that my position is V and the, and the tag, and my vector is the displacement type automatically. Uh, the automatic displacement is represented by the type you get by subtracting two positions and use the same tag as the position type does. That is cool. And with this, we can write pretty much the same code. I have this window, and I have some silly create function that takes uh, four ints. And we can see how how this is translated into quite efficient uh, assembly language. Um, did you know, by the way, that 32-bit ints are passed uh, in pairs as 64-bit values in registers? I did not know until I watched uh, this example. So that's why I have this uh, huge it's, uh, the mask. But the cool thing with this is uh, if if I make a mistake, so I accidentally happen to 
try to create a window with uh, with the upper right point instead of the, the size, I get a compilation error. And the compilation error says that there is no conversion from POS to D uh, to size. So we have translated what was a, a semantic mistake, a, a, a runtime error, into a syntactic error, a compilation error. That's a good thing. <laughs> and I can still access the, uh, the, the members uh, X and Y if I wanted to, to, in this case, have an assertion to say that, yeah, the, uh, the upper right corner really better be above and to the right of the lower left one. So now, of course, the example is, oh, I should probably not use mdebug for that. So the example obviously is a little bit bigger now since it needs to move, do jumps, comparison jumps to these uh, assert errors. <laughs> so it's fairly easy to, to create a, a to create the types you need for, to encapsulate the, the semantics that you want. Um, I can show other examples also, but I, you've seen it. It's, it's nothing super exciting there. So let's go on. Not that. Um, by the way, the the links there are to to this uh, library and to the God, Godbolt example if you want to play with them. Um, I also really want to say something about uh, just briefly mentioned uh, Peter Holmberg here from Stockholm. He, who I mentioned, held a, a talk about concepts. Uh, he has a work in progress. <laughs> Oh. Uh, he has a work in progress uh, library called Elements that defines a number of useful uh, concepts. Uh, one of them is an affine space concept. Um, he contacted me before this talk and, and uh, apologized for not being able to be here, but he, he gave me the link. So, of course, I have to show it. Uh, so, but beware that it, this is work in progress, it's not done yet. But it, you kind of recognize, I guess, the examples that, that Adi showed where that the requires clauses, we say that if, if we have a two points P, the subtractive then must be get a V, the type V, which is a, a vector, and P plus V is a P. Uh, so P is point, V is vector, S is scalar in this example. And also that you can do plus equals and minus equals. So I wanted to mention these, uh, also the, the connection to concepts. So back to you, Adi. Yeah. Okay, now I still feel like I, I owe you something, and I don't know if anyone if anyone noticed this. And I, I said before, what does it mean to add two points? And let me get to that in a minute. There's another additional concept that comes from affine spaces, and that's what's called an affine combination. An affine combination is a weighted sum of one or more points. Oh, oh, that's hot. Such that one of three things, or actually one of two things holds. The first one is that the total sum of weights is exactly one. So it's, uh, uh, and, and then the resulting type is a point. The second one is the total sum of weights is exactly zero, and then the result is a vector. Otherwise, this operation is undefined. This seems kind of, uh, again, 
when you see the definitions, it might appear slightly arbitrary and not really something you might think of an example of, but we'll see that in a second. Uh, anyone who's done some computational geometry, might have you might have come across the term of barycentric coordinates. So barycentric coordinates are really the tuple of weights of uh, the sum of weight, uh, a weighted sum of points, where all the weights sum up to one. And this is kind of, if it might remind anyone of something, we'll see that in a minute. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So let, let's let's see an example. Then we have this operation, m equals the sum of a and b divided by two. And you don't need to be a big expert because it actually says that it's looking for the midpoint, right? Uh, because this is uh, the mean or the average, or this is a weighted sum, uh, essentially, uh, of, uh, we're taking uh, the, the average between two points. Uh, so ne next, in the case where these are integers, what would a plus b divided by 2b? Oh, hmm? An integer. An integer in the middle of we, let's ignore um, truncation and the overflow in this case. Because for, the, for conceptually, m is the midpoint between them. However, if a and b are, in, are, are pointers to it, so what is the result of this operation? Anyone in Sweden, maybe? You can't add pointers, right? So here the type system suddenly uh, kind of comes back and bites us because if we have an array and we want to find the middle element, we have a pointer to the beginning, we point it to the end, the middle element would be the middle element. We would want to do this kind of operation. So what, what can we do instead? Next slide. Yeah, we can rewrite it either this way, which I'm guessing most of you didn't think about this way of writing it, right? But again, this A is, uh, yeah, most of you might have thought about writing opening uh, half times A plus half times B. Um, but then again, this doesn't compile because you can't multiply a, a pointer by a scalar. So you actually must use the first operation where we take, we subtract, we get the difference between the last and the first, divide that number, that integer, that signed integer by two, and we add that offset to our pointer. Um, if you want to calculate center of gravity in any dimension, uh, for example, in three dimension, we have three points, P, Q, and R. We need to take, conceptually, take the sum of these points and then multiply, uh, divide that by the number of points. Or alternatively, we can think about it as the weighted sum of the points weighted by weights, which sum up to one, right? So this is where affine combinations really come from, is when we want to calculate um, interpolations between points. And in these cases, these are very special cases of uh, linear combinations. However, there is no support for arbitrary weights. So we can only have um, weights that sum up to one. Um, it's totally, oh uh, wait, go back one minute. So uh, the last comment is that it's not trivial to actually uh, do this in code. How can we let the compiler know that a particular addition is of points is part of a larger affine combination operation? Uh, I think there's a, it's possible to do it if the number of elements in the sum <laughs> is known at compile time. Um, it might be possible with lazy evaluations and template expression uh, decomposition. Um, but again, it's totally non-trivial, and, and uh, this is still an open question. I would love for somebody to come up with uh, something to show how that would happen. Right. So just just to close this particular part of the, of the math. Uh, now let's look at the summary of what I what we think is the, the main take-home messages. And and I think these messages are really bigger than affine types. Affine, I'm sure you will find affine types in your type systems. But it's important when you're coming to design your APIs, you have to think about the semantics, and they will guide you how to write your types, how to design your types. And strong APIs basically always strive to create this if and only if relationship between the syntax and the semantics. So the semantics uh, guide, the, sorry, the semantics guide the syntax, 
However, this valid syntax is only valid if the semantics are valid. So that means that a semantically incorrect expression becomes a compilation error. This is how uh, the, just like the unit error that we saw with the spacecraft should have been caught at compile time instead of runtime, or not caught at runtime in that case. Um, as I said, I find space, types uh, space type relations are extremely common. Uh, if you just think about the algebra in one dimension, they're very, very, uh, you will start seeing them everywhere. So, whenever you identify <laughs> these types of systems, look to math to give you the consistent and powerful APIs, because these are, these, often these operations are backed by mathematical proofs. They're prove, uh, prov proven to be consistent, they're proven to be powerful, and and even their limitations are also known by the math. So it gives you a lot of insight about your types, and it's less of an ad hoc, okay, maybe I should add this operation, maybe I should not add this operation, and then that leads to bugs and uh, using APIs. And as I said, learn more about the massive types, read more about abstract algebra, category theory. I'm dying to have some talks about category theory, introductory ones here. So, and even if somebody in Stockholm wants to give one, uh, we'll be happy to host you here. Um, and uh, I'll let Bjorn say the last sentence because I just love this one. <laughs> when in doubt. Okay, yeah, when in doubt, do what Krona does because uh, Krona is awesome. Uh, in uh, absolutely every way. Uh, mind though uh, that uh, since Chrono, Adi mentioned briefly the uh, relation between uh, affine spaces and, and strong types in, in general and uh, physics units. Uh, Chrono does not allow you to to multiply seconds for example, multiply domain durations to get the second squared, whereas in, in a physics units <laughs> library, that is, of course, a perfectly natural thing to do. So you have to take care of, think about what, what am I modeling here? But if you are in a, a one-dimensional world, absolutely uh, do what Chrono does. If, if you are in uh, multiple dimensions, two, two dimensions, three dimensions, Chrono is often a very good guide, un unless you have uh, specific reasons to do otherwise, for example, if you're modeling physical units. You want, you want to do the resources, Adi? Do what? Oh, yeah, you yeah, want yeah. to do the, the resources? Well, we're going to switch to the other slide. Okay, so we, we collected a uh, few resources. Uh, I wrote a blog post about affine space types um, at the beginning of the year, and Bjorn did his uh, type safe C++ uh, LOL talk uh, at around the same time. This is what got us started chatting on Slack and eventually led to the talk. Um, ben Dean actually just did a talk at CPPCon a couple of weeks ago called Operator Overloading History Principles and Practices, and he mentions affine types uh, briefly at, uh, after 13 minutes and seconds. Uh, <laughs> so it's a great talk. You should really watch the whole thing. But the affine types are also mentioned there. Um, this is Bjorn's example here. And my, actually, my blog post has a bunch of additional, more messy types uh, links uh, to, to, to the definition. Yeah. If you go into these out, this will be on our website. Yeah, and definitely watch uh, all of Ben Dean's talk, not, not just uh, those few it's minutes where he talks about affine spaces. <laughs> that is it. Thank you. Thank you. Question, question. Do we have questions? Yeah. Uh, you have uh, to, to shout. Yeah. Wait a sec. Okay. So, uh, question number one is: uh, Is uh, Chrono going to have uh, uh, average anytime soon? You mean like the midpoint yep. uh, example? Yes. Well, you can always do the the simple math. Yes, I can. Thing, but, uh, like, but, but it would be it would be uh, Really cool if we could do that in I think that, that's an exercise to do reader probably. <laughs> Doing affine combinations really is uh, it's a very interesting problem. I'm not sure it's even solvable with the current C++ syntax. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's a, it's, 
running to the edge. So the question is, on what side of the edge it happens Run right now? I don't know. Okay. And the second question about the UI library. Uh, uh, the uh, there is a funny thing about it. Like if you think about uh, the uh, monitors where you display these windows, sometimes uh, or some time ago we had monitors that where uh, the coordinates were reverted. So like zero was the left down corner. And uh, if uh, such UI library could build an abstraction that would handle both kinds of uh, uh, monitors, it would be also cool. That is a good idea. Yes. But again, you can always template your types on the policy well, of the origin. Yeah, well, the trick is, no. Oh, no. The trick is that uh, for the user of the library, it should, it should, it should, should be, be agnostic. He doesn't know which monitor you will be using, okay. and uh, you want to have abstraction around it. That's a good idea. Okay, we have a, a question here in Stockholm. Uh, uh, I was thinking about the uh, examples of uh, Eigen library and uh, GUI libraries. Uh, perhaps you could elaborate on if they're using type defs as like points versus sizes and vectors versus points. Uh, so if they're using a type def for convenience and that's an old habit or something, I don't know. Um, the I don't remember which of the GUI libraries I, I looked at that did which, but they they varied wildly. Um, some of them uh, used type defs to sort of document the intent. Some did not. Some just used the naked ints everywhere. Some had at least some kind of uh, XY struct type. So they varied enormously. But no one did, no one tried to. Uh, make a distinction between a, a position and a displacement. Yeah, actually, I think uh, I saw some even worse examples where the point and the vector were distinct types, but which didn't even interoperate properly together. Yeah. But each one had a faulty API design. So it's like the worst of all words. Yeah. <laughs> so you GUI library developers out there in the world, you know what to do. Do we, we have another question? No, I think oh. it's C sharp win. Size and uh, I've often seen type uh, size as a different type. But it, again, size is more like um, sometimes it behaves like a vector, sometimes it doesn't. The problem is the API semantics. It's not necessarily the fact that there are distinct types. Okay, okay. Uh, I had two questions for you. I have a. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, first question you mentioned GUI libraries and algebra. Did you take a look at the 2D graphics proposal from Guy Davidson and the follow up linear algebra that was shown at this G14? I think it was on my to do list for a while and then I forgot. <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> Well, we have a recording of your talk. I can always send it to Gaia. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, second question, you were talking about sources that link uh, mathematics uh, as a design principle. Uh, did you by any chance read the book that I need to read but never managed to, uh, the, the one from uh, the implementer of the SDL uh, from mathematics to generic programming, I think yes, it's called? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. I should really read that. Yes. The two books, the elements of uh, programming. programming and uh, generic um, the mathematics of generic pro of generic programming, uh, both of them are amazing books. I would recommend uh, whoever has enough time to at least read one of them. They're very similar. Uh, actually, David Sankel has several talks about using uh, category theory to uh, instruct API design. 
which you could think of as a kind of a more general or slightly a variation on the same type of talk we just had. So look them up. I think CppCon 2016 and 2015, C++ now around 16. Cool, thanks. Malmo? More questions? All right, then thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.